Welcome. These videos were recorded while I taught topics in econometrics over Zoom, but they were edited so that the student faces, their questions, and my answers to those questions do not appear. That explains why you may notice some unnatural transitions and why the videos are shorter than a normal lecture. But hopefully you will enjoy them anyway. Bye now. All right, so today we're gonna talk about contiguity. Oh. And um, all right, so uh, past and future, last class, remember we started this second part of this course, and then we talk about naive power approximations, we talk about local power approximations, and we did everything in the context of the symmetric location model, where we compare the performance of the t-test and the sign test in terms of power. Um, and um, today, uh, we're gonna talk about absolute continuity and likelihood ratios um, as a starting point, as a warm up to get into the notion of contiguity. And in particular, like comes first lemma and like comes third lemma. Um, and then once we have these tools, we're gonna go back to the symmetric location model that we analyzed in the previous class. And we're gonna look at the behavior of the Wilcoxon sign rank test. We're gonna see that this test is more complicated to analyze at this too, but then the idea will be to illustrate that the tools that we're gonna to present today are really powerful and they allow us to analyze cases that are a lot more complicated, even though we're still gonna to stick to the setting where things are simple. Um, uh, but this is, you're gonna see that analyzing something like this, sort of like by hand or brute force, which is what we did before, uh, would be um, complicated. But so what's the idea of today's class then, is to see if we can learn tools, okay, that give us a, a general way to think about this type of approximations that we did in the first class um, in, um, and, and see if we succeed at that. This is not a super popular topic in econometrics, although, of course, if you talk to um, econometricians that do asymptotics and local approximations, they know about these things, but it's not included in every single uh, program that you will find. It's, it's, of course, a very classic and standard problem in statistics in general. Um, but um, still, I think that if you're not doing, again, econometric theory, it is important to know what this notion is. And in the same manner that you probably got an idea of what local approximations were in the previous class, then I don't want you to be scared moving forward. Somebody comes and tells you continuity and you go like, oh, no, you know what it is. Um, you know how it works and you know what it is used for. Okay, despite not perhaps not being super familiar with uh, the actual mechanics behind it. All right, but as I said, we need to start from the beginning. And we're gonna start from the beginning and that is we're gonna uh, revisit. I'm assuming that perhaps Joel talked about this or somebody in your life before talked about this. If not, it's fine as well. We're gonna revise the notion of uh, absolute continuity and likelihood ratios. So I wrote today, it's about a technique to obtain limiting distributions of a sequence of statistics under underlying loss QN from a limiting distribution under loss PN. And so here I'm not calling null alternative because what we're gonna do is not restrictive to testing, okay? It could apply to any other setting. But the idea is that there are two sequences of distributions. One that I'm gonna say is easy, which is gonna be PN, and another one that is gonna be complicated, which is QN. So in the context of testing, PN is gonna be the null hypothesis where we know that it's easy to derive typically limit distribution and so on, and QN are gonna be some type of alternative sequences. But in other contexts, they could play different roles. So we're gonna start with this problem that I'm describing here, first in a non-asymptotic version, okay? Just infinite samples. And so for that, we're gonna use this definition. It says, let P and Q be measures on a measurable space, um, sigma A, and then omega, sorry. Uh, we say Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P. If for every measurable set A, we have that whenever P assigns probability zero to that set, that implies that Q also assigns probability zero to that set. And if that happens, we say that Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P. And we're gonna use this notation um, um, Q like, you know, two less than symbols, uh, P. And so 
This is something that we're going to use today. Um, and notice that is a definition that is not like applies to both. It's just Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P. It could be that P is not absolutely continuous with respect to Q. So it's like asymmetric by definition. Uh, it could be that both are absolutely continuous to each other. That's possible. But the definition is just one relative to the other ones. And as I said, we care about Q. So we're going to uh, phrase everything um, as Q as a function of P or with respect to P. Furthermore, we're going to say that P and Q are orthogonal if omega can be partitioned into omega P and omega Q that are uh, disjoint, okay? Such that the probability that under P that or the mass that P assigns to omega Q and the mass that Q assigns to omega P are zero, okay? So an orthogonality is going to be denoted by this. So if you just want to, you know, put this in the simplest terms possible, okay, absolute continuity, okay, is just essentially going to tell you that the support of Q is included in the support of P, right? So if P assigns probability zero, Q assigns probability zero, okay? And then orthogonality means that they just put positive probability on different areas of the space, okay? So they're not overlapping. So how is that going to be useful? Well, it's going to be useful through the radon nickel theorem, which I know Joel talks about. Um, so suppose Q and P are probably measures on this measurable space. Then Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P if and only if there exists a measurable function L such that this happens. That means the probability that Q assigns to set A can be written as the integral over A of this function L with respect to P. And this holds for any A. And the function L here is called the radiant nicotine derivative or likelihood ratio. So this is essentially saying that you can compute probabilities under Q by using P. Sometimes, depending on the literature and the context, whatever, these are called uh, related to transportation problems where you just want to transport from here to here. Like you can use one measure to say things about the other measure, okay? And so the translation between P and Q is just going to be this function L that, as we said, is called a likelihood ratio. So today, this likelihood ratio is going to play an important role as we move along. Note, I said two measures P and Q need not be either absolutely continuous nor orthogonal. That is the case. Sometimes, you know, uh, there are going to be two measures that are not neither. So, you know, um, so it's not that these definitions are exhaustive in any means, by any means. But suppose that you have two measures that have densities little p and little q with respect to a measure mu. This is called a dominated measure. Okay, then you can write this omega p as the set where the density of P is positive and the uh, omega Q as the set where the density of Q is positive. And if you use this notation, then for any measure Q, okay, you can just write it as QA plus Q orthogonal, okay, where QA is just the mass that P A assigns to A when that intersects with an area where P, the density P is positive. And Q orthogonal is what you assign to A in the area where P is zero. And you can see that the sum of these two is just going to be the mass that Q assigns to A. Okay. And so this decomposition is called the Levesque decomposition of Q with respect to P. And we're going to be using this decomposition in the statements uh, below. But as you can see, it's just a, a decomposition where intuitively says the probability that A happens can be partitioned the probability that A happens and something else happens and the probability that A happens and this other thing doesn't happen, which is essentially what you have here in these two indicators that you are mapping. Now, the important thing that we're gonna that we need to keep in mind today is that the likelihood ratio is a random variable. Okay? So it's just we write as ZQ DP, but in the previous slide I write as a function of X is a random object, okay? It's a function that is a random object. And so today, part of the uh, discussion that we're gonna include is about the properties of this random variable under some distributions. 
And remember, something that is confusing sometimes when students get faced to a lecture like this for the first time is that, you know, we're so used to say like, oh, it converges here, it converges in distribution there, it converges uh, in probability there and so on. We make these statements because we're always working with one distribution, typically the distribution that generates the data that we call P or whatever. So we don't clarify. But when you're in a context like this and I ask you, where is this random variable going? Well, first question would be, okay, under what distribution? So because the random variable may be going here or there, depending on how it is distributed. And here we have multiple measures. In particular, we have Q and P. So we will have to clarify, okay, what we mean when we say something has this property, has this distribution, conversions in distribution, and we'll have to clarify under which. Anyway, let's just look at this lemma. This lemma says essentially uh, three alternative ways, okay, to um, <clears throat> define absolute continuity um, and, and, and a definition. So let P and Q be probably the measures with densities P and Q with respect to a dominator measure mu. Then Q can be partitioned into QA, Q uh, orthogonal, where QA is absolutely continuous with respect to P and Q orthogonal is orthogonal to P. This is the Lavac decomposition. Two, the Q, the part that is absolutely continuous with respect to P satisfies the random Nikodim theorem. So we can just write the probability of A as the integral of A, likelihood ratio DP. This is what we had before, okay? And this holds for any measurable set A. Notice that this is not for Q because Q doesn't need to be absolutely continuous, but we're saying there's a part of Q that is absolutely continuous. For that part, we can do this. And then finally, and this is the one that we care about today, is this. Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P if and only if the probability that Q assigns to the set that P assigns gives zero probability is zero. This is the definition that we used before. And if and only if the integral over the entire space of the likelihood ratio with respect to P is one. And this is just saying by using this function where we translate from P to Q, we don't lose anything. So we just integrate everything, we recover everything. That's one. Okay, so these are three different ways of looking at absolute continuity, okay? You can say this, you can say this, and so on. Implications. The function little q over little p is the density of qa with respect to p, okay? It is denoted by dq over dp, not dqa over dp, okay? And that's something you know, some form of confusion sometimes. But in other words, we're saying that dq over dp is just qp p almost surely. Okay, so we're going to be uh, using this notation dq over dp, understanding that we may lose stuff under the way if the distributions are not absolutely continuous. Okay, if they are absolutely continuous, then this is absolutely fine because qa and q are exactly the same. It's just notation. So, one question that we will be interested in answering today, later on in the limit, but now in final example, suppose that we have a test statistic. Could be an estimator, could be a test, could be anything. Let's call it an estimator or a test statistic, and its t is a function of x. How can we compute the distribution of t under q if we know how to compute the probabilities under p? The answer that is, if q is absolutely continuous with respect to p, then Q law of a random variable X can be calculated from the P law of the joint pair of the random variable and the likelihood ratio through a very simple uh, formula. Let's just write it. So suppose that, let's just do the expectation, expected value under Q of X, okay, which is the integral of X dQ. Well, you can write this as the integral of x. And remember that we're assuming that q is absolutely continuous with respect to p. So mechanically, it's like, again, just multiply and divide by dp. And then this is the expected value under p of x times the likelihood ratio. So you see that you want the expectation under Q and you can compute that under P, which is the easy distribution. Of course, it's not just expected value under P of X, but it's just you need this 
this behavior of X and the likelihood ratio, okay, jointly. So the validity of the formula that I just wrote works because, you know, we're assuming that Q is absolutely continuous with respect to P, because if it wasn't, then it's obvious that any part of the Q that is orthogonal to P cannot be recovered through P, right? Because if P is saying, if Q is saying things in areas where P assigns zero probability, then of course we cannot recover that through P. <clears throat> Can I just ask something about the notation? Mm -hmm. um, so what exactly is the difference between small Q and large Q? I mean, I get that the capital Q is just the, the measure, but what exactly is the small Q? Uh, small Q is DQ over the mu and small P is DQ up. DP over the mu. So of course, you know, here, uh, you could just divide by d mu above and below. And then you will have little q over little p. Okay, got it. Now I see. Thank you. Okay. Good. So that's it about absolute continuity. Any questions about that? Now we move to contiguity. So what we want to do now is to have some asymptotic version of the problem we pose. Now we're going to have a sequence of measurable spaces, you know, and for each n, these are going to be equipped with some pair of probabilities, pn now and qn. And then now instead of having a fixed that's statistic or estimator. We're going to let Tn be some random vector, okay? And the idea is that the asymptotic distribution of Tn and their P is easy, as I said before. But the asymptotic behavior of Tn and their Qn is not as easy, and it is also required, okay? And so, again, the main question is, under what conditions can a Qn limit law of random vectors Tn be obtained from suitable Pn limit laws? And again, an example is Tn represents a test function. Pn is distributions under the null versus Qn, which is distribution under the alternative. So the power of Tn is the expectation under Qn. But typically, we have a good characterization of the behavior of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. All right. So the concept that we need to answer this question is called contiguity. And it is sort of like an asymptotic version of absolute continuity. Hmm? That's what we're going to do. All right. The first thing is to say, well, perhaps absolute continuity for all n is what we need. So we're doing asymptotics, we have a sequence of random variable, and then we can say like, you know, what if we just say, well, Qn is absolutely continuous with respect to Pn for all n. And, and you know, that's what we have, and that's, maybe that's, that's enough. So this example over here, which is extremely simple, is saying, look, uh, Pn is just a sequence of normal 0, 1, so Pn doesn't even change with n. And then Qn is a sequence of normals with mean psi n here, psi n or zeta, which one is this? Well, it doesn't matter. And so um, this is psi n, um, where psi n goes to infinity, okay? So this is a sequence that is changing with n, okay? Well, first, um, it's easy to see that this holds here, right? Because these are like both uh, normal distributions with some mean, okay? And they just put support on the entire real line and then if you just um, look at events, uh, you know, any E, any EN, such that P of EN is zero, will imply that Q of EN is zero. I don't know, take the rationals or something like that, some, or some isolated point, and that will happen. So it's true, these two are um, absolutely continuous for all N. 
But the problem is that when we do asymptotics, one thing to remember is that we're not saying anything about what's happening at all n, but what we care about is things in the limit, right? So a concern here is that what if we have a sequence of events, en, such that p of en goes to zero, but q of qn of en does not go to zero. And this um, can actually happen because, you know, if we let en be x such that x minus psi n okay, is less than one, then you can see that pn of en goes to zero because this is just an interval of length um, two. And it's just moving to the right, to the right, to the right, to the right, and eventually pn signs probability zero to that. Whereas qn of en is roughly 0.68 for all n. So now we see that having something like this, absolute continuity for all n, is not enough to help us with asymptotics because then we can have situations like this where this sequence of pn is just not assigning probability to certain type of events in the limit, whereas qn assigns, you know, in principle, a lot. And then we won't be able to recover these things with a sequence like this. So this tells us that um, to study asymptotics, absolute continuity for all n is or does not appear to be useful. What we need is something different. We need something that allows us to say stuff in the limit. And that definition is the definition of contiguity. So here we say, like Qn and Pn be sequences of measures. We say that Qn is contiguous with respect to Pn. And we're going to denote this by this little inverted triangle. If for each sequence of measurable sets An, we have that whenever Pn assigns probability zero in the limit to this type of sets, Qn also assigns probability zero in the limit to those type of sets, okay? Absolute continuity for all n does not imply contiguity. And we're gonna see an example in a minute that is gonna show the other way as well. Contiguity does not imply absolute continuity for all n, okay? But let's see if we can study this normal example a little bit more because it's gonna be useful later. Suppose that Pn is the joint distribution of NIAD observations from a standard normal, and Qn is the joint distribution of NIAD observations from a normal with uh, mean psi n and variance 1. Okay, so this is the same example that we had before, except that now we're just having an, a sample of NIAD observations for each of these distributions. So unless this psi n here goes to 0, P and Q cannot be continuous. And if you are following, this starts having the flavor of what we did last class when we started talking about local asymptotics because we said, well, if we want to say something about power that is not degenerate, we will want this sequence of alternatives to get closer to the null distribution. And here we're saying, well, in order for this to be contiguous, meaning to say something about Q using P, we will need the mean of these random variables to go to zero. To see this, suppose not. Okay, so we're gonna suppose that psi n is greater than epsilon, some epsilon n is positive. And then I'm gonna say let en now be the event that x bar n is greater than epsilon divided by two. Well, by the law of large numbers, 
we have that the probability under Pn of En goes to zero because essentially Xn converges in probability under Pn to zero. But Qn of En converges to 1, because under Qn, x bar n minus psi n converges in probability to 0. This, of course, violates our definition of contiguity. So we know that then a uh, minimal requirement that we will need is that this psi n goes to 0. Actually, this is not going to be enough. We will need... I n to go to zero fast enough. And if you have to get a rate, what would that rate be? You, you don't want to guess. You don't like guessing games. Just gonna be square root n. Sorry. Ah. In particular, we want you know you can write this as square root n psi um, needs to be bounded. We're gonna see this in a minute, so I'm sort of like giving you a preview of what's gonna happen, but. The moral is, in order to have this contiguity, we will need this i n to go to zero. We will need the mean of this uh, sequences q n to just converge to the one of p n. Okay, and then uh, not only that, as I said, we're going to need something slightly stronger, which is it needs to converge as a, at a certain rate, and we're going to see this. All right, let's move along. Now. We're going to present Lacombe's first lemma. Okay. So Lacombe noticed the following. When you think about absolute continuity, and then you just go back, I'm going to go back for a second, uh, to this part of the lemma that we showed before, sort of like absolute continuity had these three pieces. Okay. This, if and only if, this, if and only if, this. And then Lacombe proposed this uh, symptotic version called contiguity. The question is, well, you have something like this. You know, here I'm rewriting again the three uh, notions uh, that that we wrote in, in that slide. It's written slightly different. We can't show that this equivalence persists if the three statements are replaced with their asymptotic counterparts. Okay. And so now as we move along, I'm going to be using this notation, wiggle PN to the no conversion distribution under PN, because as I said before, Writing conversion distribution is not going to be super useful because we're going to say under QN and under PN, and so this is going to be better. So this is Lacombe's first lemma. Let PN and QN be a sequence of probability measures on a probability space, uh, omega N, AN. Then the following statements are equivalent. First one, QN is contiguous with respect to PN. The second one says, if DPN, DQN converges under QN to a random variable U, at least along a subsequence, then the probability that u is positive is 1, which is the same as saying that the probability that u is 0 is 0, okay? So notice how u here is essentially dp dq because u is the limit of dp dq, and it's a limit under q, which here you're just, in the finite sample version, you're just computing the probability under q. So if you look at this statement and this statement, you see that they're really uh, the same, except that one is sort of like an asymptotic version. The third part is dq dp under pn converges to a random variable b along a subsequence, then the expected value of this random variable b is 1. And this is essentially this part, if you look at it, okay? It's just you're computing expectations under p, you're computing conversions under p, you're looking at dq over dp, dq over dp, which is b, and then you're asking that the expectation of that is 1, which is what you're obtaining here. And then the last bar says, for any test statistic, if the test statistic converges to zero under Pn, 
then it converts to zero under Qn as well. And the part that we're going to use a lot today is this one. Out of Lacombe's first lemma, this third part is the one that proves to be very useful because it's one way of checking and the usual way of checking contiguity. You look at the likelihood ratio, you look how the likelihood ratio behaves asymptotically along the sequence Pn, and then you check if the expected value of the limit and object is one. And if that's the case, then you're good to go. By the way, Lacan wrote all these lemmas that I want to present today and also other stuff as part of his dissertation. So, you know, you're all PhD students thinking about things to do. Uh, it's, it's a good bar to have, okay? So just think about it. It's possible. Lacan did it. Corollary. This is the one that we're going to use at the end. This is sort of like a, a special case of this third bullet point. It says, let dq over dpn converse under pn to b, and suppose far that the log of b is normal, zero mu sigma. That is here is that b is, has a log normal distribution. Then qn and pn are mutually contiguous if and only if the mean is negative half of the variance. Okay, and why is that? Because expected value of a log normal distribution is this, and that's going to be one if and only if this happens. And you can tell me like, oh, why do I care about this log normal distribution? Well, because we know, if you remember things that you've done in other contexts, that it's very common for the log likelihood ratio to be asymptotically normal. And so this is exactly, I can put the log here, the log likelihood ratio converges to a normal. And when that happens, how do you check contiguity? Well, contiguity happens if the mean equals negative half of the variance. So it's very easy to check in this type of settings, okay? You just check whether the mean is negative half of the variance. And believe it or not, that's what we're gonna be doing in the next few slides. We're just gonna take things and just check whether the mean is negative half of the variance because we're gonna have asymptotic normality of the log likelihood ratio quite often. Anyway, before I move into that, I said that contiguity does not imply absolute continuity. We showed before that absolute continuity for every n did not imply contiguity. Well, I said the other way also holds. Contiguity does not imply absolute continuity for every n. So consider this case, which is very simple. You have this sequence uh, uh, Pn, which is just uniform 0, 1, so it doesn't even depend on n. And Qn is uniform 0 theta n, where theta, theta n converts to 1 and is greater than 1. So first we need to check <coughs> if, this are, if Qn is contiguous. So it's a question, like, is Qn uh, contiguous with respect to Pn? Well, we have Lacombe's third lemma to do that, which is look at dQn over dPn. And again, you can just look at the densities with respect to some dominated measure. These are uniforms. So this is going to be 1 over theta n, and this is 1. So this is 1 over theta n. Well, this is a very simple case because this likelihood ratio here is not random. It just depends on theta n, okay? So this, of course, converges under pn and under anything to actually not a random variable, to the number 1. And, of course, the expected value of 1 is one. So they're contiguous. But now let E, E n, be the event theta n, whoops, be the event uh, one, the interval one theta n. Then you can see that Pn assigns probability 0 to En for all n, and the Qn assigns positive probability to Qn for all n. So they are not, or let me say Qn is not absolutely continuous 
with respect to PN. So hopefully with these two examples, we just get the point contiguity and absolute continuity. None of them imply the other one, okay? They're very similar. They have very simple uh, characterizations. That's what Lacan first lemma gave us. But at the end of the day, you know, looking at sequences and looking at the behavior in the limit are different, different goals. So you don't have this. But now what I want to do is I want to go back to the examples that we were discussing before with the normals. And I want to see if this corollary over here is actually useful. And also um, I want to see if uh, we can say something about when we have this connection between the mean and the variance and what do we need. So let me go back to the example where we have one observation from a normal 0, 1, that's Pn, and one observation from a normal say Qn, which is normal psi n1. And then if you compute the log likelihood ratio, which is the log of dq over dpn, okay, then uh, this is what you obtain. If you don't, I mean, I'm assuming you see this, but um, just for concreteness, let's write, you know, the density dqn over d mu Let's, we call this before little qn. It's just the density of a normal, okay, which is going to be the, a constant times e negative one half um, x minus psi n square. Okay, let me write that as c e to the negative one half x square plus two x psi n plus psi n square, and then for p, it's just a standard normal. So you're going to have a constant times e negative half x squared. All right, so when you do dqn over dpn, you essentially have e negative half x squared minus 2x psi n plus psi n squared. Uh, plus, oh, uh, sorry, minus x squared comes from the p. So these two cancel out, and then this is negative half of negative 2 psi n plus psi n squared. And then when you take the logs, you get this expression that we have over here. All right? So now, what's the distribution? I'm going to erase this. What's the distribution of the log likelihood ratio? Well, it depends on, you can see here, your assumption of what is the distribution of x. And here, the distribution of x could be pn or could be qn. But remember that these um, the Lecomte's third lemma, or the corollary that we have here, is about the behavior under Pn. So then I can write here, under Pn, you can see that this is normal with mean negative half psi n and variance psi n squared. because the variance of x under pn is one, and then this guy will be here square, and then there's a constant, and then the expectation is zero, so only the expectation is just this guy. And so one thing to know is that here, you see already how we have this connection between the mean being negative half of the variance, okay? Which is what we need for distributions to be contiguous. However, we can't stop here because the corollary and Lecomte's lemma says that this guy converges in distribution. And here there's a sequence. It's not in Pn because x is just x, but there's this psi n. So the idea works, okay? So Qn is contiguous with respect to Pn as long as psi n does not diverge does not diverge. So 
we need psi n to be bounded. Of course, one example would be if psi n converges to some psi that is finite, then our b will have a distribution that is normal with mean negative half psi square variance psi square. And this will imply continuity. If this psi n doesn't converge, it just oscillates. Suppose that it's one and negative one all the time, plus one, negative one, plus one, negative one. Well, you can take a subsequence. And that's why when you look at this statement, it says along a subsequence, okay? So it doesn't have to converge, but you can just um, take a subsequent that it converges, which is um, take one, and then you check whether the limiting thing has variance one. And here I'm using the corollary that tell me if this limit on B has, um, sorry, here I, I forgot to add the, the log, okay? So log of B is normal. And so we have this connection between the mean and the variance. And so we learn that as long as psi n is bounded, these two are contiguous. And before we sort of like claim the same thing using the definition, right? In the previous example, now we just can see these using Lecomte's first lemma. Now the case that is more interesting is the case in which uh, we did before where Pn is the joint distribution of NID observations, okay, from a normal zero one, and Q is the joint distribution of NID observations from a normal psi n in one. So in this case, if you write the log likelihood ratio, well, it's exactly the same than we had before, but now you have a sum of the x's here, okay? And then actually, I should have written this as the square root n psi n times one over square root n sum from one to n. I just divide and multiply by square root n. It just makes the argument simpler or cleaner, if you want, because then this guy here has a normal distribution, standard normal distribution under Pn, right? And so if you see that, then immediately you see that the distribution of the log likelihood ratio is a normal with mean negative half n sigma square uh, and variance n sigma square. Again, this relationship between the mean and the variance that you need for contiguity holds as long as we can claim that this guy here converges along as a subsequence. When is it gonna converge? Well, it is gonna converge along a subsequence, if and only if n times psi squared remains bounded. And that means we need psi to be convergence at rate square root n. Voila. And then if these are the local asymptotics that we were doing last time, we said we need theta to converge to zero at the rate one over square root n. And then I said, problems that are smooth and so on will satisfy this. Well, we're gonna see that in order to have well-defined, you know, analysis of local power, we're essentially saying that these distributions are contiguous, and then the definition of contiguity is gonna tell us how fast this parameter needs to go to zero. Before, we sort of like, one over square root n was intuitive. Now it's just coming from the definition of contiguity. Comments. The sequences of measures Pn and Qn do not separate <coughs> asymptotically. That's what contiguity is telling you. Like given data from Pn or Qn, it is impossible to tell with certainty from which of the two sequences the data is generated, at least in an asymptotic sense, as n goes to infinity. It actually says much more, as I said here. Contiguity makes possible to derive asymptotic probabilities computed under Qn from those computed under Pn. And this is the content of Lecomte's third lemma, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, and the main application, which I'm not gonna read here, but um, it's uh, here for completeness, is the application of uh, comparing statistical tests under the alternative hypothesis when you consider sequences of local alternatives. And so a well-defined sequence of local alternatives is a sequence of alternatives that is contiguous to the null. So if you read more advanced papers sometimes, okay, you're gonna see that instead of uh, researchers talking about local 
alternatives, sometimes they're going to talk about contiguous alternatives. Okay. So it's like, oh, under contiguous alternatives. Well, that's exactly the same. They're just saying alternatives. Okay. Where you can map one probability from the other one. It's just depending on the tricks that they're using, but they're exactly the same. So I wrote here, contiguous alternatives will not allow this type of degeneracy that I described here when, you know, we had in the naive case where one was going to zero or alpha and the other one was going to one. Okay. Um, and so um, are the ones that are typically used to um, compare for tests. So when you get to this point, and we're going to discuss in a minute, you may say like, okay, this is fine. But at the end of the day, you're just telling me that we're introducing all these alternative notation, conceptual complication, because clearly the notion of contiguity, even though it's not mathematically complicated, you know, conceptually, you need to be aware of what's going on. And we actually analyze the t-test and the sign test without using any of this. Okay, so what are we getting into this? Well, we're getting into this because what this machinery does is to make the analysis of this type of power comparisons really simple in general cases, okay? And later on, actually what I'm gonna do next class, we're gonna come back to the example that we analyzed on Tuesday, and we're gonna analyze this using the concept of Lecomte third lemma and local asymptotic normality, which we're gonna see next class. And I swear that everything that we did in the first class, we're gonna do in two lines. When you just do one line for the t-test, one line for the sign test, and done. Okay, and that's how, um, of course, you know, again, you can say like, well, you save a line, but you added two lectures. Yes, but then when you go to other things, you're gonna see that these tools are powerful. So are there any questions about uh, what we've been talking so far? We're all experts on continuity now. Uh, we can keep going. Here, we're gonna present Lecomte's third lemma, another lemma that Lecomte wrote in his thesis, so, you know, just want to motivate you guys. It says the following. Suppose that you have a test statistic, an estimator, it doesn't matter, a sequence called Xn, and the log likelihood ratio, and you look at the joint behavior of this. And suppose that the joint behavior of this under the sequence of distributions Pn converts to a normal. And then let's let's look at pieces. First, you have the Xn is mean mu variance sigma whatever it is, and then the log likelihood ratio, mean negative sigma square, variance sigma square. Notice that here we're saying that these two distributions are contiguous because the mean is uh, negative half of the variance. So in, in this statement, suppose that blah, it's saying suppose that Q and N are contiguous, okay, because it's this. And then, you know, it's also saying, well, the test statistic and the likelihood ratio may be asymptotically correlated. That is, is tau over here, okay? Good. Then, the behavior of this test statistic under QN is also a normal with the same variance and a mean that is just mean mu plus tau. Voila. This is just fantastic. Tells you if you have this setting, the only thing you need to know to understand the behavior of your test statistic, estimator, whatever it is, under the alternative hypothesis or under the alternative sequence is tau. And tau is this the limiting covariance between the test statistic and the likelihood ratio. That's all you need. You know that, you can just derive the behavior under the alternative. It's just a simple correlation, simple covariance, okay? And so if you focus on testing, I wrote here with asymptotically normal test statistics, Xn, a change from an all hypothesis to a contiguous alternative induces a change in the asymptotic mean in the test statistic equals to the asymptotic covariance between the test statistic and the log likelihood ratio and no change of variance. And it follows from here that a good test statistic have large asymptotic covariance with the log likelihood ratio. Okay. So in a way it's also, you know, we know the advantages of the likelihood ratio tests in parametric models. Here we are seeing also how in the asymptotic experiments that are not going to be parametric, they're going to be semi-parametric and so on, then good tests are going to be highly correlated with the log likelihood ratio. And we're going to see what, how can we exploit this, uh, especially tomorrow. But this is a very powerful lemma, Lecomte's third lemma. Because quite often obtaining this 
believe it or not, it's not that difficult. Okay, so it's just finding a covariance. And in the case of the sign test or the t test, we're going to see in the location model, we can get this in one line and then computing this covariance will be blah, and then that's it. We don't need like Lindbergh, Feller, CLTs. We don't need anything like that. Just get it by just computing tau. So I'm going to illustrate that today with going back to the symmetric location model, and we're going to analyze the local asymptotic power of the Wilcoxon sign rank test. Okay, pretty sure you may not even know what it is. Doesn't matter. Okay, um, it's one of the famous uh, rank tests. Okay, so example, we're going to suppose again the p theta is the distribution of the density f of x minus theta on the real line. We're going to suppose that f of x minus theta is symmetric about theta. We're going to observe a random sample from f. We're going to test the null hypothesis that theta is equal to zero. It's exactly the same location model with the same assumptions that I included before. So I'm not adding and subtracting. I'm just being brief about it. What is the test statistic? Well, remember what we had tn, uh, sn, and now we're going to have wn. wn is n to the three halves sum from one to n of the rank of the ith observation times the sine of xi. And so the sine of xi is going to be one if x is positive, negative if otherwise, negative one. And then the rank is just the rank of the absolute value of y among all the other observations, which I wrote here is the rank of the absolute value of xi among all the other absolute values of the observations. So as you can see, even though like computationally this test statistic is just quite simple to uh, compute, and you want to start analyzing behavior under the null under the alternative, it's just been complicated in particular because of this guy, okay? And so um, what we're gonna do is instead of doing fancy things, we're gonna just gonna try to see if we can apply Lagrange's third lemma to analyze this guy. And we're going to see quickly that the behavior under the null actually is quite simple. The behavior that is difficult is the behavior under the alternative. Okay, so let's do the behavior under the null. Here's the test statistic. We are going to um, rewrite this test statistic. Okay, so I'm going to say let. Mm, whoops. Let ui be g of the absolute value of xi, where g is the CDF of the absolute value of x, okay? Then note that ui minus 1 over n and this rank object r plus i n is u i minus one over n sum j one to n of the indicator that the absolute value of x j is less than or equal to the absolute value of x i. This is little o p one by I'm going to write here the law of large numbers, but importantly is uniformly over i. So I'm actually using here Glivanko Cantelli, which I think Joel covers in 480-2, but essentially gives a uniform convergence of a estimator of the CDF. Okay, and then if you look this uh, rank object here is just an estimator of the CDF of the absolute value of x at xi at that point. So converses uniformly. So then this wn object is, um, I'm going to write it as um, n to the negative one half sum from 1 to n, 1 over n, rn plus sine of x i, 
and this is the same as n to the negative half sum from 1 to n of ui sine of xi plus little op1. Here I use that the op1 doesn't depend on i, so we can, you know, if you add and subtract, you can just take it out. And then we have this average of these random variables that is u times the sine of x, and I'm going to call zi. Well, under p naught, which is when theta is zero, notice that, you know, the absolute value of x and the sine of x are independent. And so we have the expected value under P0 of zi is, um, you can write as the expected value of ui times the expected value of the sine of xi. And this is zero because this guy over here is zero. And under the null, the variance with respect to p naught of zi is the expected value of zi square, which is just the expected value of ui square because the square the square of the sine is just one. And this is one third. So now just by the usual CLT, we have that WN then converges in distribution to a normal zero and variance one third under P zero, the null. And so the test that is gonna be point wise asymptotically level alpha is just square root three WN greater than z1 minus alpha. And this is the Wilcoxon sign rank test. Obviously, but what we just did, this is point-wise, asymptotically, level alpha. Any question about this? So we just manipulated to get essentially rid of these ranks, okay? Which are the objects that that are annoying. And you can see here in this slide that analyzing things under the alternative, if I now just include theta n, some sequence theta n, and then p theta n as we did with the sign test would, would complicate things dramatically, okay? So we just don't want to do that. And the question is like, okay, is something like the Comte's lemma gonna help? And the answer is gonna be yes. But the Comte's lemma, as we saw in the statement before, requires two things. It requires, or two parts, it's joint behavior of whatever test statistic you care about. In our case, it's just gonna be our W here and the log likelihood ratio. So first we need to understand the log likelihood ratio, and then we put the two things together. What comes third lemma I wrote here suggests we look at the joint behavior of the test statistic and the log likelihood ratio. We're gonna do a simplification today. Why? Because today we don't have the tools to analyze the log likelihood ratio in general. That is the topic of next class when we talk about local asymptotic normality. We don't know that yet. So what we're gonna do instead is just focus on the normal case, which is a specific case of the symmetric location model. And we're gonna go back to the general case next class. So suppose that the sequence of alternatives are normals with mean theta n, and then all is of course where the mean is zero, okay? This is of course the density of the joint distribution of these n observations in the normal case. And so when you look at the log likelihood ratio, you know, we did this today multiple times, it's equal to that where here uh, we're using that a square root n theta n is equal to h, because remember we define theta n as our sequence of local alternatives. And so the log likelihood ratio 
takes this form over here. Okay. And so now you put together and look at this. We have one over square root n, the sum of u times the sine. That's essentially the term of our wn. And then we have h times one over square root n sum of x the minus h, um, h squared divided by two. This is the log likelihood ratio. So when you just think about this tau that we need, because this is gonna be asymptotically normal, right? Because both of these pieces are asymptotically normal. So you can show that jointly they depend on x, they're gonna be asymptotically normal, both jointly. So what we need is just the limiting covariance. Whoops. And so look at this, this is gonna be the covariance between ui sine of xi comma h time xi. So this is going to be h time the covariance between, let me replace u with g of the absolute value of x and then I'm going to change something, sorry. This is under p naught, that's important. So this is going to be expected value under p naught of g of the absolute value of x times the sine of x times x, because the covariance is the expected value of the product minus the product of the expectations, but the expected value of u times the sine of x is zero according to distribution p, so this is equal to this over here. And the sine of x times x is just the absolute value of x. So this is h times the expected value under p zero of g of the absolute value of x times the absolute value of x. And this you can solve integrating by parts. I'm not gonna do this today. It's not difficult, but it's just gonna be h divided by square root pi. Okay, so what's the behavior of our test statistic Wn under the null hypothesis? Well, it's just gonna be a normal with the same mean as if we have on this p naught, which is zero, plus tau, which is h divided by square root pi, comma, one third. And so now, if you just look at the probability that, uh, let me write, instead of the probability, probability under qn, or let's use the notation here that we're using, sorry the probability under theta n that um, we set the square root three, wn is greater than z woman alpha. Well, this is equal to the probability theta n that is square root three. This is not bar, I'm sorry, so sloppy. Uh, is less than h divided by square root pi, greater than z one minus alpha, minus square root three divided by pi times h. And then under p theta n, this converges to a normal zero one. So this converges to one minus the CDF of a normal z one minus alpha minus square root three I times h. And that's sort of like um, what we obtain. Questions about this? Well, you see how we derived the local power function of this test statistic without doing any sophisticated CLT or manipulation, we just only calculated the covariance between, you know, this object that we're summing here and this, which is this object that we're summing here. And that's it. Which again, it involved computing this expectation, which in this case 
was Im simple to do because we're um, working up in the normal case. But notice that this expectation here is under P naught, it's under distribution under the null, which you know makes it simple typically to compute. Okay, and I said you know you can integrate by part if you just do it. It's, it's not sophisticated. Um, so then you have the behavior under the null, and then it's really easy to manipulate to get this object over here. All right. That's it. Finished way earlier today. Perhaps I went too fast. Or perhaps you were particularly quiet. Perhaps both. Okay. So uh, next class, we're going to talk about uh, local asymptotic normality. And the idea is that this simplification that we did over here, we just don't want to do. We want to see if we can say something about this join behavior by looking at an object like this without assuming join normality. And the answer is going to be yes, we're going to be able to do so if the model is so-called local asymptotically normal. But that's the topic of next week. For now, I want to answer um, questions, okay? <laughs>